these nations, on whose traditional territories we live, we learn, and we do our work. And I think as we begin our work uh, here tonight, it's also wise that we acknowledge all the other uh, energy going on, the protests. There is a lot happening in the world on top of a pandemic. Um, what a challenging thing. And I know we're, we're dealing with it as a, a board and a district as well. I just want to acknowledge that. Um, we're, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Trustee Elaine Leonard is the chair of this committee. And uh, I am stepping in and doing the Zoom thing. And um, while I've done a few of these, it's still a bit of an inexact science. So uh, we'll just go slow and steadily. Um, I watched our ed policy meeting with uh, Trustee Duncan chairing and did such a good job of allowing that, that conversation to flow because it is very different than our board meetings that are a little more formal. So I'm gonna try and do my best, but certainly anybody who wants to pipe in, including our student rep, uh, Lanny, I hope I pronounced that right. You know, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you and pull you into the conversation. Um, so first we're looking for approval of the agenda, which is a fairly full agenda. Uh, Trustee Whitaker and Trustee Leonard, any, Secretary Treasurer Morris. Can't hear you. Was there an addition to the agenda? from Trustee Painter. Trustee Painter, would you like to add something under notice as a motion? Uh, no, under a motion for today's discussion. Uh, I was just waiting okay. for the opportunity. Okay, where would you like it, Trustee Painter? Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, H5. It's new business. New business, yeah. Can you give us a taste I've, of what it is? I've uh, emailed it to everyone and to Andre for, uh, for consideration. I can just read it out right now if you like. Okay, if this is a, this is a, around, I'm just looking in our email, um, school liaison officers. Yes. Because trustee Ryan Painter has already submitted a notice of motion to add to our agenda with regard to that. So just my oh, Okay, of I'm sorry, us. I am looking at that right now then. Uh, I, so I'm not sure how you want to proceed. Would you mind letting uh, trustee Ryan Painter introduces notice of motion when we get there. And if you feel like that it doesn't do it and you'd like to have a conversation or move something from the floor at that time. I see you, uh, Trustee McNally. You think about it, Trustee Painter, and I'm gonna go to Trustee McNally. Thank you, Chair. If you could just give me the timeline on Trustee Ryan Painter's notice of motion and Trustee Rob Painter's uh, emailed um, motion which he'd like to bring from the floor. Could you Ryan, Painter's, there, Ryan Painter's trust, uh, his notice of motion came yesterday and trustee Rob Painter's came at 6.55 p.m. Thank you so much. <laughs> Tonight. Just under the wire. Bless your heart. <laughs> I mean, I think we're all trying to do the same thing, which is enable a good conversation around that. So exactly. Would it be of process. Would it be possible to, to share that around so that yeah, I'm happy. I'm uh, sorry, Chair, may I? Yes, please do. I, th I thought we were going to in the first place. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, did you did you want me to read the motion here or how did you like me to proceed, Chair? Sure, because we are adding it at notices of motion. So it'll be I. Yes. A. Sure. Yeah. So my notice of motion. I won, I suppose. Yeah. So my notice of motion is as follows that the board instruct the superintendent to immediately enter into a process to explore phasing out of school liaison officers in SD 61, and that this take place at the September operations meeting. So this is a notice of motion for September ops, is that? That's correct, yes. And I'll send an email out right now. I apologize, I should have done that. 
Trustee Painter, Rob Painter, uh, did you want to amend our agenda or do you want to, or can I, we go to notice of motion and? No, I, I, I do want to offer my motion at H5. I uh, would suggest that what I am proposing is uh, uh, a step short of what uh, Trustee Ryan Painter's motion is. I think they might be complimentary, but uh, I think that uh, they are distinct. Okay, so we are adding at um, I1 notice of motion for trustee Ryan Painter and at H5 for trustee Rob Painter. And both of those topics are with regard to uh, student liaison officers. So everybody can amend your agenda to reflect that. Any other amendments to the agenda before I call for a vote? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amended agenda? Oh, I can't vote. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, Trustee Whitaker. You can't vote either because we're at ops. No, you are ops, sorry. Uh, can, so on that uh, chair, can we do a proper introduction yeah, of uh, who is just on this and voting? Sorry. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. Thank um, you. Let's, I do have a motion on the floor though. So yeah. I'll say that our members of this committee are trustee Ann Whitaker, trustee Angie Hensa, trustee Elaine Leonard and trustee Rob Painter. And myself as the chair is an ex officio. So are there the five of us voting members? And then we are lucky to have trustee Ryan Painter uh, with us today and trustee Diane McNally who are, will vote anything that passes here at our ops meeting. will go forward to the June board meeting in two weeks and all nine trustees get a chance to vote and speak to the motion. I believe time. chair, we're lucky and to have Justin 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 Justin. in here as well. Pardon me? Hi. Yeah, Trust no, it's just second. Yes. Hi. As well. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's hard to see everybody. Um, okay, so I'm going to call for the vote on the mo on the amended agenda. All those in favor? And all those opposed? Trustee Leonard is opposed. Trustee Whitaker, Rob Painter, Hensa, and Waters are for the motion, which passes. And Andre, if we go too fast, you feel free to pipe up and slow me down. I will, for sure. Okay, are there any trustees on this call that I've not introduced? Okay. Okay, well, let's move forward to the minutes. So we're looking for approval of the minutes from March 2nd and May 11th. There's two different motions there. Trustee Whitaker, will you move the March 2nd? Any comments, questions? All those in favor? And that's unanimous. So we'll move to the May 11th. Can I have a mover? Thank you, Trustee Leonard. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Any business arising from the minutes? Seeing none, I will move to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, want to take a moment once again to uh, have introductions for Loni, who joined us from Lambrook Park today. Always great to have one of our student reps here. And as you mentioned, she'll put up her hand and join in the discussions and share her valuable opinions as we go through. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, on to summer school, Colin, if you can bring us updates on summer school 2020, please. The only new information to add to the memo that's provided on page 13 of your pack up is that the uh, Registration for the 2020 summer school is actually now open, uh, thanks to the great work by the Information Technology for Learning Department. Uh, they were able to have our online registration process up and running much more quickly than we initially thought would be possible. And so it's uh, opened for the first day today. 
with the registration closing now one day earlier on June 25th to just give us that one day to try and organize before our summer school starts after the long weekend. Do we have any questions, Mr. Roberts report? Trustee Rob Painter. Uh, yes, uh, to Associate Superintendent uh, Roberts. Uh, I understand these are going to be uh, completion courses as opposed to full courses, if that, that was the conversation we had before. And if we could just provide uh, uh, what the rationale was for doing it in that manner. Mr. The, uh, there are two, two reasons for that. Um, first, the credit courses are very intensive and so very difficult for a, a student to complete the whole credit course within that four week period even when under normal circumstances. So a four, four to five weeks of full instruction followed by a considerable amount of home study on the part of the student in order to meet all of the required learning outcomes for that course. But uh, given that we now need to operate summer school under the provincial health organization guidelines and the fact that students will only be able to attend uh, on a rotating basis. So for summer school this year, we're thinking two days of in-class instruction and two days per week of at-home study. Whereas we think it's a, a realistic ask of our students to, uh, to work through a program with, that they are somewhat familiar with in terms of a, a completion course, we think is realistic. But to ask a student who has no experience in a course to go from zero to completion and cover all of the required learning outcomes when they're only uh, receiving 50% of the face-to-face -face instruction that they would have done in any normal year. Uh, again, we've, we thought that it would be best just to limit this year's selection to uh, the completion only. And the second reason was we wanted to ensure that in this year's school year in particular, anybody that needed to complete a course for graduation would have the opportunity to do so. So we're, by limiting our course offerings to just the completion courses, uh, we can guarantee or ensure that everybody who needs to complete that course or pass that course in order to uh, acquire central graduation credits will be able to do so. Thanks very much. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to Human Resources Staffing Update, Tammy. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for giving me a few minutes tonight to give you a brief update on the staffing. Um, I believe that the memo is on page 14 um, in the pack up. Um, on that page, um, there is a chart provided and it breaks down the numbers of our employees that we have in each of our partner categories. Um, both showing the continuing contracts as well as the temporary contracts or people that are on call. Um, there's a column on the far right that just shows how many people have been hired between August 1st and June 1st. So those are just some statistics for you. Um, particularly, my area of focus has been on the educational staffing. Um, in response to contract compliance and with regards to class size and composition, uh, since 2017, several TTOCs have been hired to the district and they continue to be hired. Um, there is no shortage of applications. In fact, there is an abundance of applications coming to us, which is great. Um, it does allow us to be somewhat selective in our screening process and our interview, and our interview process. And um, we just wanna make sure that our students have the very best people. Um, this isn't to say that we're not looking for generalists. Um, in fact, we get a majority of our generalists from the UBIC education program, um, where we get a lot of our elementary teachers and a lot of our humanities teachers. Uh, we do, however, continue to still face some challenges um, in the hiring of specialists and, of course, educational assistants. Um, on the piece of paper, on the bulletin, I've listed a few of our recruitment strategies. 
Um, you can see at the bottom right hand corner, um, there is a, a picture of um, one of our students. Her name is Aurora and she is from Quadra Elementary School. And um, a thank you to Aurora and her family for allowing us to use her picture on several of our ad campaigns. Um, this being one of our creative ways of trying to get people to apply to the district. So a huge thank you that way. And also a huge thank you to Lisa McPhail who's helped with a lot of our ad campaigns as well. So we're definitely going um, a little bit outside the box and trying to attract people into the district. So this year, um, beyond our own hiring fair and our ad campaigns, we participated in several hiring fairs across Canada. Uh, we've had some representatives go to um, UVic, UBC, University of Calgary, Queens, University of Ottawa. And of course, our particular interest was in French immersion, um, a specialty area that um, it's really tough to get teachers. So enticing teachers to come to Victoria sometimes isn't that easy. Um, we definitely have the amazing weather, but the cost of living or also known as the sunshine tax sometimes prevents people from wanting to move here. Um, we have, however, had some success. Um, we've hired 16 more French immersion teachers in the last five months. So that's pretty incredible for us to add to our list. Our fingers are crossed though, that they actually stay with our district. Our worry is always that they jump to our adjoining districts. Sometimes it's not to our advantage to have uh, two districts so close to us. Um, we find that many, many of our TOCs are on all three TTOC lists. So um, the game is trying to get them here and keep them here. Uh, besides French immersion and language specialists, we continue to look for other uh, specialists in the area of tech ed and home ec. Um, at the secondary, we're always looking for senior sciences, math and computer science teachers. And at every level, we're always looking for counselors, inclusive education, ELL, teachers and teacher librarians. I put a little part um, at the bottom of the bulletin called celebrations. Um, just in looking at some of these specialist areas, um, it's really positive that we actually have some of our own teachers filling some of those gaps in that they are taking master's degrees and completing diploma programs. So they're becoming counselors and librarians and ELL mm -hmm. teachers. So it's really nice that we have teachers filling gaps that way. So a real positive. Um, along with teaching staff, um, a lot of time has been placed in hiring educational assistants. Um, in this area, I can't say that we've had a flood of applications, um, but we have had a lot of candidates, again, who have um, applied to us and they have degrees or experience in the area. And subsequently, these applicants made excellent candidates for our EA Bridge program that um, I introduced to you at the very beginning of the year. Uh, we ran three cohorts this year, and we've had close to 40 hires out of those cohorts. So that's a real celebration for the district as well. Unfortunately, COVID prevented us from running our fourth session. Um, we're hoping to um, do more sessions the, the next, the upcoming year. So we're hoping that the, with economic stability and a return to some semblance of normal, that we'll have a more positive impact on staffing as we move forward. So thank you for allowing me to present tonight. Any questions? Thank you so much for your presentation. I'll go to Trustee McNally and then Trustee Rob Painter. Thank you so much. Um, I'm still, frankly, afraid to say your last name. Could you just say it for me? Sure. Sure, Stabidoff. Sure, Stabidoff. Yep. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, I just have one question uh, for a column that isn't there. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for this uh, complete presentation. On page 14, um, just after the new hires, uh, I'm, I'm imagining a column just to the right of that, which might be net loss or net gain. Um, is there any possibility of getting information into that imaginary column to make it real? Absolutely. So I, I don't have that to share with you right now, but definitely we have retirements um, and people who have um, gone, they've left the district or have chosen to not return to the district. So um, I don't have the information though in front of me. So is that what you're referring to, Diane? You're muted, Diane. I'm, just, I'm thinking net, you know, so that retirements might be offset by 
new hires, but you know, I'd like to see the net numbers if we could do that. Thank you so I could much. Do that. In terms of net gainers. Trustee Rob Painter. And you're muted. Sorry, I was trying the space bar and it wasn't working for me. Uh, I was just wondering uh, about the, uh, these I take it are, are people as opposed to FTEs, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so is there a significant distinction between the two or in this case? I'm just wondering, uh, you know, when I look at, uh, uh, say for example, 97 EAs hired, that sounds great. I was just wondering, is that, how does that translate into number of FTEs, et cetera? So with the 97 hired, those would have been hired to spare boards. So they would be covering people who are either absent because of illness or perhaps absent on leave. So if indeed they did pick up a temporary contract, they would be picking up the hours of the EA that actually has the continuing contract or temporary contract for that matter. So these are the, and of those 97 EAs, I actually do have numbers on this, of the 97 EAs, about 53 of them have been placed into contracts. Okay, are there any other questions of Ms. Shurstabidoff? I think I got that right. You did. Okay, well, thank you so much for that update. I appreciate it. I know it must be very strange doing this under the current circumstances, I'm having to shift practices a lot, I'm sure. So next we're moving to our facilities planning. Uh, it looks like we've got an operations update. Mr. Morris, Mr. Baggett, Mr. Souls, and Ms. Vistason Hardwood, are you all here? Hi there. Um... Jim Thanks, and Chuck. Jim and Marnie couldn't make it. Something else had come up. So okay, um, I know we're working them right off their feet. So fair we enough. Are. <laughs> well, the in, in the packup, it, my uh, operations report is on page 15, and uh, it's fairly in depth. They've got a few photographs to have a look at. It starts with major capital, um, Brayfoot. Uh, we're coming along quite well, and it's going to be ready. Uh, we're just about ready now, if we're not already doing it, moving things back into rooms that are uh, out of the floors, cleaned and ready for acceptance. Um, we had just a little, but probably about a week slowdown with COVID um, a couple of months ago because of uh, electrical company. One of their fellows thought that he had something wrong. So the company pulled back for the week and uh, it's all good. So there's nothing, uh, any any major slowdown there. Uh, Vic High, the uh, things are going along very well. Their third and fourth floor are closed. We're beginning to pack things up. And as SJ Willis has floors ready, we are starting to move things over to those rooms to try to get ahead of the curveball for uh, moving Vic High to SJ Willis for September start. Uh, it's a lot of work but we're ready for it. Uh, other than that, Jim is hard at work on uh, the PDRs, uh, various versions of them for Cedar Hill, for um, uh, Shoreline, and some of the other ones that we're trying to get ready for submission to the ministry or resubmission to the ministry. Uh, they they made a few little changes there, so we're responding to those. Um, and they're, they're changes for the good. Um, so we're moving along quite well with that. He's really busy and, and uh, um, a good good operator, let's say. Minor Capital, um, that's where Marty comes in. Uh, they are really very busy. Uh, we're doing a, an awful lot of work out there all over the entire district. Uh, we've got uh, quite a number of trades people working on major on sorry Minor Capital and getting quite a bit done. Uh, the parking lot outside of Tolmy uh, will be ready. It'll be paved at the end of June, and uh, the lines will be on there shortly after that, so uh, we'll be able to start using it. 
And it's taken a little bit longer only because when we started to excavate, we found there was some very loose fill that had been put in there years ago. So we had to deal with that and um, compact the new material and, and to allow us to keep on going. The building in the back, the Tolmy Trades Training Center is ready. We're just waiting for the occupancy permit. And then we'll be working like mad in there, building our uh, child care units and any portable classrooms that we have. Uh, child care locations, uh, the two at Doncaster are almost ready to turn over to the uh, child care provider. Uh, they, I was there yesterday just driving by and having a look at the situation and they look awesome, much like uh, Frank Hobbs. We got uh, Vic West is progressing very well and uh, Telecom. If you drive by Telecom, you'll see the two units there. They're uh, framed um, coming along. They're actually coming along at a pretty good rate of speed. Uh, there's been some roofing tenders uh, completed and awarded. The Spectrum, the old gym facilities, Quadra Warehouse, and working on uh, DDC for Telecom as well. Uh, that's uh, heating controls. Still got a lot of inclusive learning that uh, we're still plugging away on. And on page three of my report, there's a couple of photographs there relating to campus view. Um, those portables that were spaced sort of haphazardly, uh, we're moving them into a pod formation at the end of the West Wing. And the photos just so show uh, a crane lifting one of the pieces off the back of a truck to swing it over into place. So it's a pretty good operation going on there and then uh, it's right on time. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, Mount Doug, we've got some windows upgrading. So we're getting rid of, uh, I think this is phase three or four now for, for that site. Uh, upgrade from single pane windows to um, double glaze. Uh, Torque, we've had uh, painters there and they painted the exterior of that building so it no longer looks like an A&W. Uh, it's, it's pretty nice with the brown uh, metal siding painted brown and uh, it, it's what it, I've had nothing but compliments about that building. Moving on to occupational health and safety, Brian's been going like mad um, between uh, Josh and Dosh and COVID-19 and then training. Uh, he held a training session for uh, a number of our people on crane operation because we've got a crane in the Tolmy building. Uh, maintenance may report. Maintenance has been very busy. We haven't slowed down at all, even with the COVID. Uh, we've adhered to uh, uh, recommendations to stay out of buildings or away from occupied areas of schools while we get our work done. And uh, that's been going along pretty well. There's more, a little bit more in-depth information in there if you uh, read this at a later time. Uh, Arch Fraser's group, uh, Network Communication Security Systems, uh, he's completed seven, uh, I think it was 723 service requests over the last couple of months. That's phenomenal. Um, so he's been going great guns. And at the same time, we're trying to update some of our sites to a FOB system and get rid of the old pin pads. So we're well on the way with that as well. Uh, operations department, um, our custodial group been working really diligently cleaning and disinfecting our buildings on a daily basis during these uncertain times. Every school that I visited uh, and spoke with the custodians, they were hard at it and seemed genuinely pleased to uh, be doing what they're doing to help maintain uh, what we're doing there. I, I include a photograph of one of our custodians from uh, George J. And uh, he's always smiles and friendly fellow and he's doing a great job there. Transportation and fleet, we are busing kids right now. Um, right now, we're currently busing approximately 26 gar with Garden City and 37 students in the third wave um, buses. We've got kids all registered for September. We uh, roughly 160 Garden City riders and 95 on the third wave short buses. Uh, Eric's right up to speed on all of that. Uh, the ones we're busing right now, there's a strict adherence to separation. So um, uh, what we're moving right now per bus, if you had one bus filled, it would take you three buses to move just strictly because of separations. Uh, but that's how it worked. That's working out quite well. 
Um, and then I just close, and needless to say, the past few months have been pretty hectic, scary, and worrisome as we develop safe methods to work during COVID. Uh, my congratulations to all of our staff for the job, very well done. Um, it's, a, it's a real good thanks team effort. That's it on that. Any comments, questions? Well, and my thanks to you, Chuck, and all of your staff. It really is impressive, especially given the challenges of the current situation. Uh, Trustee McNally and then Trustee Ryan Painter, I see you have questions. Um, Chair, I think <coughs> Trustee Painter was first all of us. Oh, it was very nice of you, Trustee McNally. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I uh, just really wanted to reiterate what uh, Chair Waters said about the amazing work being done. So happy to see that picture of uh, uh, Melchor Lucas, I believe, uh, from George J. That smiling face just really makes me connect with all the amazing work that um, custodial staff and really everybody has been doing. So, And, and this report in itself was fulsome. So really thanks for that. I, I did have two specific questions when I read about the first aid kits and I apologies if I've asked this before, um, but I'm wondering about um, uh, AEDs, uh, automatic electronic defibrillators and the uh, disbursement of them in our school district and where they might be, if we, you know, where we have them, if we do, I'm just kind of curious if, if Chuck, you have any information on that? Uh, it's my understanding we don't have any. And I think it boils down to um, possibly a financial end to supply them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and the other piece was just the busing out to Thetisvale. This is, being that I live now in Thetisvale as of December, um, this is actually something that I've heard uh, from parents about, uh, you know, wanting to get some more access to a Thetisvale route. So really happy to see that there is that, um, that route, uh, that fourth route service to Thetisville area. I'm just wondering, and this is my own naivete, um, what is the route and how, how does that route get chosen and how are parents notified about that route? Uh, I don't have that route information with me at this point. Um, the routes are based on where students live and the software usually does the route because it is able to optimize um, the best routing uh, to, for those children and for uh, the buses. Uh, uh, Ryan, I can certainly supply more information through Eric after if you're still curious. Uh, uh, yeah, just 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 because I know some parents have asked me about it. So that would be really great. Thanks so much, Chuck. The really amazing report. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Trustee McNally. Thank you so much. I have a, a question. But first, I have uh, um, just uh, Kudos, a, a compliment. It's so nice to see you on page five of this report. Um, uh, a major push from our department to take our maintenance program from a reactive model to a preventative model. Having watched the struggles of facilities over many years, you know, I'm uh, practically choked up here to read that. It's just so wonderful to read. And I hope it works out for the department, Chuck, because it's um, very gratifying for everybody else to see that wonderful, wonderful work and great to look forward to that. Um, on you. page six, on page six, just for the masses of people who are watching us live stream <laughs> and who may not know the difference between um, service for uh, Garden City and third wave buses, could you just, um, just uh, tell us why we have those two bus companies? So third, third wave are the short buses uh, a number of them, or maybe all of them, have uh, wheelchair access, and they move our children that are um, physically challenged and, and have uh, some a few other little issues. Garden City are the regular buses, and they're the normal bus that you might see on in any district uh, hauling children to and from school. Uh, they, they, those are two busing contracts that we have right at this point. Thanks so much. Trustee Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks so much, Mr. Morris, for your report. I just have one quick question, uh, and it's to do with the portable at George J. I'm just wondering if we have a timeline. I know 
um, having read your report that uh, we're waiting for approvals um, from the city. Um, are we expecting the portable to, to be ready and, and in place in the fall? Uh, we are. It's, it's, we're working with a couple of different people within the city of Victoria to expedite their process. They've had the, um, the information for three and a half months already. Um, so it's, they know it tends to be slow sometimes. So uh, we're working with them almost on a pretty regular basis to urge them through. The portal will be ready. Portable will be ready probably within two weeks. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, I'll sort of pause here. Trustee McNally's uh, mention of the live stream, and I do think we have three folks tuning in currently. Welcome. I do just want to let them know that uh, if they have questions for our question period, what the webs the email address is, and I apologize for missing that at the start in my enthusiasm to get us going. So the email is ops, O-P-P-S committee, 06, well, sorry, 0608 at sd61.bc.ca. So it's ops committee, O-P-P-S committee, 0608 at sd61.bc.ca. And now Chuck, we're back to you with the carbon neutral action report. Are we? The car, our carbon neutral, um, the report for, here we are, I'm just trying to dig it out of my pack up here. The report, because the ministry changed um, some formulas and the way they want it done, uh, and with such short notice that they advised all districts around the province to submit it based on the method they did last year. So um, ours is slim, but what we're doing is, and especially with uh, my next report about energy manager, um, we've already got lined up a raft of other projects that deal directly with uh, lowering carbon, uh, sorry, GHG, greenhouse gas emissions. And when this report comes through next year, uh, you'll see the, the difference. We'll, our intention is to drop the GHG emissions as much as possible. Uh, we've got a number of uh, solar projects, uh, solar voltaic projects lined up. We've got uh, solar uh, wall collectors and those are, um, those capture heat within a, a an additional wall, a, a metal wall that's about six inches out from the existing wall of the school on one side. Uh, it captures heat and it introduces that back into the heating system within a portion of the school or the gym, what have you. Um, just to give you an example, in one of my past lives, I was up in the northwest corner of the province and uh, I put one of those on South Hazelton Elementary gym wall. And at minus 13, we were pulling in five degree air into the school heating system. So that really drastically cut down on the amount of uh, natural gas we were using to, to uh, heat that building. So we'll really benefit from things like that. And, and I've got a whole raft of other things lined up as well. Bless you, Chuck, for going with that when I screwed up and jumped ahead on our agenda here. I'm having challenges because I've only got the one screen and see, I want to see all of your faces and then also see our agenda, which I don't have. Uh, That's okay. You're just testing us. Well, you know, five of you passed. <laughs> <laughs> Getting lots of text messages, but um, if it's okay, let's just go with this and we'll have some questions here at H2 and then I'll pop back up to F2 and you guys can all rib me about this later. Uh, Trusty Painter. Rob Painter, sorry. Just to, this is a complete non sequitur, but one of the things I was recently taught, and so I'll pass it along, is that down in the bottom 
set of your bottom row of your keyboard, there's a little Windows icon. If you click that Windows icon and one of the arrows left or right primarily over on the other side, you can actually split the screen. So right now I have Zoom on one half of my sheet or one half of my screen and the agenda package on the other. I find it quite handy. Uh, Thanks, one, one request uh, possibly moving forward. Uh, uh, Mr. Morris, with the, when we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions, one thing that I'm really interested in is understanding individual projects. Uh, like for example, um, there was mention of uh, uh, remote controllers for the, the boilers uh, coming in or uh, improving uh, the windows, going to double glazed windows or something like that. I realize that you know, trying to summarize all of those up could be really messy, but as one-offs, I would find it really interesting if we could actually see what the relative impact of say, going to double pane for Mount Doug, how that's cutting GHG versus, uh, you know, the boiler and how that's reducing, you know, our, our consumption of natural gas or whatever. So just for in years to come, if that's something that we might be able to work in, I think that would be really informative. I agree. And, and um, uh, Rob, that will be included. Yeah. Any other questions on the carbon neutral action report? Or comments? Okay, Mark, you thought I was gonna let you get away. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're back in order here at F2. So it's the leases and rentals COVID update, which I'm sure is uh, bleak. Yeah, thank you for thank you for having me here. Um, so not the not the greatest report to give out. I'm sorry, this is my introduction to the group. Um, but I've got a, a quick summary that I've got on page 21 of your packet. Uh, since spring break, uh, pretty much everything was shut down and this is kind of the, the best summary I can give you uh, of all the, the numbers there. So we're looking at an estimated rental uh, loss, loss revenue from a lack of rentals of about $185,474. Um, the only revenue we did see through this time is a small amount, which is $1,852.50. And that is for the Moss Street Market, which we, after a couple of weeks of shutdown, opened it up when a uh, public health officer opened up farmers markets. Um, and we've been working closely with their organizer to make sure everything's being done safely. So it's, it's been a learning process and I'm glad that we got to work through it. Uh, so that's the big number for uh, internal and external rent, uh, rental revenue. And I want to just be clear that that's sports, um, productions, uh, any kind of any other small rentals in, in spaces. Uh, the, the next big number is our daycare uh, revenue. So our, our out of school care daycare uh, revenue losses in the second paragraph. And that's summed up to uh, an estimated lost revenue of 156,828. Uh, there, there, we will see some revenue come back on this one. We haven't charged, we forgave all daycares under school cares because they didn't have anyone coming in and paying for their services. So we could not charge them rent and, and drive them out of business. That didn't make sense. So uh, we are now doing, a, uh, we're now counting back to the days that they did have people in through April and May and June, and we're doing a, a prorated charge, and we're going to for, sort out the average number of children attending each week and give them a prorated charge so that we can still make some revenue. They can, they've can they still earned some, some money from those kids, so um, we're not putting them out of pocket, but we're also not putting ourselves out of the same pocket. So that's a summary of the daycares and out-of-school cares. And the last bit I wanted to put in there is that we do have day camps coming into our, our schools in July and August. And that is to support uh, children of essential service workers through the summer months when uh, people still wanna work. 
And so uh, our, our Saanich joint use agreement will be honoring that and we're, we're modifying how we're dealing with them to make sure that they're taken care of through the summer. So we're still kind of working through the, the details of that. I think I'll leave it there and open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trustee Rob Painter. I got questions for everyone tonight. Uh, hi, Mark. Thank you very much for, for your report. And uh, right off the bat, I, I don't want to put you on the spot because I appreciate this might be uh, above your snack bracket. But uh, uh, the, the determination about uh, forgiving the lease invoices, I was just wondering uh, how that ties in with uh, what I understand the provincial government was actually offering uh, uh, I don't know if it was loans, but they were offering um, funding to maintain um, uh, childcare, daycare spaces. Uh, and that seems to be in place, whether the facilities were open or closed. What little information I've been able to see online doesn't really speak to what the amounts are, but I was wondering if you had any information on that side. Um, it is, it is above my, my, my pay grade, I will be honest. Um, and I think Kim's just, uh, stuck her hand up agreeing with that one. <laughs> um, but, uh, yes, it is, it's a case by case for sure. We, um, and it's all about which daycare is applied for what funding in different places. So we, this is going to be the month of rectifying those numbers. And I think we're going to be working through, um, how we start, um, Putting, uh, putting our invoices together for April, May, and June, depending on each situation. And it is different for each one. Um, and I, I'll leave it at that. If Kim pokes her nose and then wants to see something different, she may go right ahead. Secretary Treasurer. Always like to poke my nose in. Um, I think uh, Mark hit it on the head. Uh, it's all part of sort of looking back and seeing what kind of revenues people brought in. Uh, to charge them fairly without putting them out of business, as he said, and to also try to recover as much revenue as we can. So uh, busy time. Trustee Duncan and then Ryan Painter. Thank you, Chair. Um, just going back to Trustee Rob Painter's question, um, would are you able to clarify whether or not we've asked um, child care providers whether or not they've applied for any um, funding, like publicly available funding, um, whether there's any kind of discussions of that nature that have gone on, um, just to make sure that where there is funding to help those folks that they apply for it. And so we're not providing a subsidy in, in effect unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, I can't confirm if those discussions have happened. That is what we've talked about discussing with them. And those those talks are starting to happen now. So I, I don't have an update for specifics, unfortunately, this time. Great, thanks. Trustee Ryan Painter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this will be really quick. Uh, uh, Mark, I, I, I don't doubt that this has been a difficult time to deal with in the uh, building operations side. So thank you and your team for all your work. Uh, it was great to meet you and see you and hear from you. Uh, and we hope to see you back in the future uh, with some really great news. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Secretary Treasurer. Uh, yeah, I just want to... Um, uh, commend Mark for his work. Uh, he's new in the role and uh, has taken on all of these cancellations and rejigging the, uh, I'm sure, myriad of phone calls he received and handled them beautifully. Uh, I had very little um, contact with any kind of renter and he passed anything complex through, through me. And uh, I think uh, also to be recognized for the great job he's done uh, with all of the custodians and, and uh, they were first on the ground in COVID and and uh, he's done a great job in terms of that new role. So thanks, Mark. Thank you. Okay, seeing no more questions, we're at F3, which is the Climate Action Report. Uh, Energy Manager, back to Chuck, and that's at page 22 in the packet. 
Well, climate action. Um, as facility services, we've identified a number of options that we are going to initiate to deal with the climate emergency. Some of the options that I've mentioned before are net zero on new buildings, collecting energy from solar panels, heat from solar wall collectors, and a lot more. That's where our energy manager comes in. So an energy manager will assist in identifying realistic greenhouse gas reductions over an identified period of time. This will include electric and gas reductions, and in some cases, gas el elimination because of net zero initiatives. So we're really hoping down the road for more and more of those. Um, lower electricity consumption by up to 9% through staff behavioral changes. And I've seen that work when I was in Saanich with our energy manager out there. Um, and that made a big difference. Require external funding for energy conservation projects. Utilize data and formulas to identify best case scenarios for solar energy installs, solar heat capture uh, installs, and other methods of lowering GHG emissions towards target goals. So we've been working with BC Hydro for probably nearly a year behind the scenes to acquire um, a position that they will support as an energy manager with SD61. They only have 60 um, energy manager positions that they support throughout the province. When one of them completes their four to five years at a district, that opens up a spot. So they were full. And when Saanich finished with theirs, um, we were talking behind the scenes and the BC Hydro fellow uh, agreed that um, we will, or they will, uh, keep it open for us here in SD61. And I recently confirmed that again with them uh, late last week. Um, they've got, Hydro has quarterly expectations uh, that the district must meet, all formula driven to allow the district to meet its intended goals and Hydro's goals, they've got a lot. Uh, this is supported through a guaranteed percentage of the manager's salary through a contract between Hydro and the district. A few other initiatives, and then I'm just kind of quickly going through the, um, the this information and pack up, but it's it's exciting, and uh, I can't wait to get moving in, in this direction um, wholeheartedly. So, uh, other initiatives that uh, energy manager in consultation with our team. Things like reducing energy loads in buildings, in encouraging passive de design standards, provide protection during power loss, uh, provide where applicable low carbon energy sources, on site renewable energy, solar readiness, implement heat recovery where feasible. We're already doing that on a smaller scale. Perform energy audits. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Uh, and nurture educational benefits for schools with the work that we carry out. Uh, an example with that is um, once we get a school set up with uh, solar voltaic, um, and this again goes to one of my past lives up in Mid Island, uh, where solar, uh, you generate electricity with those panels, uh, it's fed into the system, hydro buys some of it back. Uh, but there's, um, you can put a gauge and, and uh, good descriptors that indicates live action, what you're actually producing from the solar panels. And uh, it's a really awesome benefit to uh, the kids. Uh, this one particular case I'm thinking of was in an elementary school. And it's, that's all they talked about. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting some of that going here. Um, so right now, I think we've got a, uh, should have a posting coming out in the next one to two weeks, hopefully, uh, so we can get our energy manager position filled and then we're on our way. Thank you. Thank you so much, that is super exciting. I am thrilled. Uh, Trustee McNally and then Trustee Ryan Painter. Thank you so much. Yeah, it is pretty exciting. Um, years ago, when I mentioned solar, it was just too expensive. And so the technology is much more accessible.
the bull now, it seems. Um, I'm looking on page, uh, the last page of this report. And while you were speaking, um, I needed to look up passive design, so I did. And I, uh, I wonder with the first uh, point, um, reduce energy loads in buildings, encouraging passive design standards. Okay, now I know what that is. Um, and then the third point is on-site renewable energy. So if you could um, just tease out a difference in those two for me, because I, I couldn't explain the difference. Well, on-site renewable energy is as simple as solar voltaic, where we're generating electricity to put right back into the school. That's one really good example of it. Um, yeah, we can do it with a few other things as well. Um, but that, that's the best, simplest example of on-site renewable. So getting energy from the sun through a solar panel, uh, that's renewable resources. They're just about every single day being fed into the school. So we use less power from BC Hydro in this case. Um, what some of this also does, uh, allows us to do is to start reducing some of our uh, fossil fuels that's the whole goal is to do that. Go ahead. So is that, sorry to interrupt, is that, is that sort of the same as passive design standards then? Well, I just want to be sure I understand. Sorry. Passive design standards uh, implement a number of other um, methods of, of retaining um, energy dropping what you're using for fossil fuels uh, try to get it down to a minimum passive design you want to um, encourage energy savings which and, and a building that does not have a lot of um, leaky windows or or air movement coming in from the outside from other sources there's a number of techniques that you use when you're doing the building um, to get it moving towards a passive design Thank you so much for those answers. I've got Ryan Painter and then Trustee Rob Painter. Thank you, Chair. And, and again, thank you, Chuck, for this really exciting report. I love seeing the work that we're doing um, on, uh, on climate action. Um, and, and I'm really excited for this, uh, this energy manager role to, to get rocking and rolling. I think that's going to be really really cool. Um, and your plans are really energizing, um, quite exciting. I had a question and I'm not quite sure if it's for, it's if it's actually for you or for the secretary treasurer. So uh, feel free to um, <laughs> pass this on, but just curious about um, how this uh, uh, carbon uh, or sorry, climate action report and energy manager piece, is there anything from the carbon neutral capital program that is going towards this, or is this just solely um, being funded through the district? I'm just curious because I know we get funding through the carbon neutral capital program. I'm always curious where uh, that money is being spent and how much we're getting. So I'm sure. not sure if you can answer that directly or not, but thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they've just increased last year, the CNCP funding that was available. Um, I'm hoping they'll do it again this year. So we draw uh, funding from that to go towards uh, energy reduction and, and uh, fossil fuel reduction. Same thing with the SEP program, the school enhancement program. Um, I'm hoping they increase the funding for that as well this year. But projects there are designed, uh, a good example is um, a ga natural gas boiler, some of the old ones that are kicking around out there. Um, we've got one listed in there as their number one priority to change it. And I don't necessarily know if we're going to be able to get rid of natural gas there, but we can at least really reduce the consumption um, with the type of boiler. Uh, I, I know Fortis is trying to develop a, uh, an afterburner for the gas appliances, so that'll really help as well. Um, that sh I think they were doing some beta testing on it here about two months ago when I was speaking with them. So there's a lot of things going on in the background that uh, will help us get to where we're going. That's great. Thanks, Chuck. I always learn something new. Thank you. Well, so now we've got Rob Painter and then Trusty Duncan. Yeah, thanks again, Mr. Morris. This is an excellent piece of work and uh, you can rest assured that you've got 
full support from the board. Uh, it's not me saying it. I just listening to what I've heard in the last few discussions. But Thank one you. of the things I was wondering about is whether or not uh, we would be in a position to incorporate this kind of information uh, with the, the long range facilities plan so that uh, perhaps as we go on down the road, we'll be able to flick to whatever school and not only see what its current, uh, I can't even remember the term, its facilities uh, standard, uh, forget the, the number. Yeah. The, uh, FCI. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, but it, in addition to those that we can actually see what some of the initiatives are. I was also wondering if, although this is getting outside of the box, uh, whether we can also track the, the minor and major capital programs that we do as long as along the lines with the, the different facilities so that we can have an understanding of what work's been done, what work is anticipated or where we would have an opportunity to see some real gains with the different uh, schools. Sure, so uh, last uh, comment of yours first. Um, we, we do that and, and we can um, um, provide a little bit more narrative around that to illustrate what it's doing for us. Uh, we have a lot of uh, minor capital projects that we do. So I can make sure that on those reports that uh, we have more information on it, a better narrative. And uh, the long range facilities plan, um, Secretary Treasurer Morris is looking at reinstituting the committee and getting us going because we are fully aware that that needs to be updated, uh, especially along the facility side of things. Uh, we need to include information in there that uh, we can include with our five-year capital plan submissions. So if it's not there, then we, we're remiss. So we're looking at that. Okay, Trustee Duncan, you're up next. Thank you, Chair, and hello to your helper. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Morris. Um, again, kudos to you and the team uh, for all the leadership and hard work. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. Um, I think, you know, a couple months ago when we were talking about net zero projects and preparing ourselves um, in the future to, to be um, undertaking capital uh, planning and project work uh, with an eye for that and to see where we're, uh, we are a couple months later is uh, impressive to say the least. So thank you so much. Um, I had a question about Vic High. Um, I know that um, we are at the stage where I believe um, we're looking at um, mecha mechanical and HVAC work um, at Vic High. And I'm wondering as part of that work, whether we've considered um, preparing for uh, a net zero uh, or a, a more sustainable renewable heating system. So for instance, um, looking at what ducts we install if we're changing the duct work uh, with an eye to the future and, and what possible energy source or heating source we could be using there in the future um, if the infrastructure in place um, would allow for it. So uh, Vic High will have natural gas boilers. Um, they'll be efficient. And if uh, certainly if that uh, afterburner device is ready, uh, we'll look at uh, incorporating that into it as well. The project is, has gone so far that uh, we can't change it right at this point, but we can certainly watch as we move through and do what we can to ensure that we're getting the biggest bang for a dollar out of it. Thanks so much. Okay, any other questions or comments? I just want to reiterate how thrilled I am, Chuck, with all the work you're doing on this. Like really, it's tremendous and it's really, really exciting as a trustee. I'm looking forward to all the things we're going to accomplish. Uh, so thank you for setting us on this path. Appreciate thank it. You. Uh, okay, so now we're moving to the next section on our agenda, which we've already dipped into, but uh, we're at H1, which is the superintendent's evaluation. 
uh, which I'm presenting to you again on behalf of the policy subcommittee, uh, which is made up of Trustee Leonard and myself. And this is coming back, it should have come back earlier, but with COVID it got uh, pushed back. And so this incorporates all the feedback from the last time it was at OPS. And uh, it's at page 29 of the pack up. And so we're hoping to uh, move this forward here in June so that we can initiate a uh, evaluation process for the superintendent. And then the plan is to review the success of our evaluative process afterwards so we could look at amending if we needed. But at this point, I think we wanna move forward. So I'm looking forward to your feedback. So I'll open the floor. Unless Trustee Leonard, did you have anything to add from the policy subcommittee? Uh, no, I did not accept that. Um, I think trustees have seen this three or four times now. So um, hopefully uh, I know that um, all of the changes that had been mentioned have been incorporated. So hopefully we, we are able in a position with very little changes, if any, to move this forward tonight. Thank you, Trustee Leonard and Trustee McNabb. Thank you, <clears throat> Chair. Um, maybe I missed an opportunity to uh, suggest some amendments earlier, or maybe I did and they didn't fly, but I'm going to suggest them again anyway. Um, on page 29, um, looking at uh, the superintendent's evaluation point one will be reasonably related to the roles and responsibilities. I would like to see that be directly. Reasonably is really vague to me. Um, looking at, I've got about four suggestions, so I'll just go through them. Um, the point two was once in a, in a four year term to do this evaluation. When Trustee Painter and I were on the policy committee, we brought forward, um, to my mind, a more robust uh, evaluation policy, but that didn't fly. So um, we suggested every year and I'd like to see annually. Um, looking at point four, we'll utilize the following, um, an anonymous leadership survey tool agreed upon by two trustees. I'd like to see a majority of trustees. And when we go down to the process, the chair will appoint, I'd like to see the board will elect. Uh, and then that on the next page, page 30, that affects point two there, the two elected trustees. So those are, the order, can we break like, these up? those are the changes I'd like to see. I don't know what. Okay, thank do you, Ms. McNally. That is a lot. I think um, yeah. probably best for us to take it one at a time. I'm assuming that you're suggesting amendments. I wasn't quite sure how you wanted to handle this chair. You said you were looking for feedback. And so I, you know, I didn't um, phrase them as amendments just more informally, but we can, uh, however you want to do this. Trustee Leonard. Um, I'm, I'm looking at process right now. Should it be on the floor to do amendments or is this wordsmithing before it goes on the floor? So, um, I mean, this is, I think, the fourth time that we're looking at this. So um, I'm hoping that we are adopting it tonight. I'm sorry, it's bedtime at my house and things are a little <laughs> crazy here. Bear with me. Um, I'm, yeah, I mean, we could move it on the floor and then move them as amendments and just vote on them and see how we get from there. That, okay. I mean, they're, I'll it's I'll not wordsmithing. These are pretty significant shifts. If you want to ask the partners first before I put it on the floor then. Certainly. And is that okay with you, Diane? And then we'll come back and we'll just move through your changes as amendments. We've, we've, okay. we've agreed that we need to ask our partners before we begin debate. This is ops. Whatever. It seems good process to me to ask our partners before we get into it. So I agree Robin with Robin or Jody. Does anybody want to weigh in on this? You can as we go along in the discussion. I'm I'm com I'm comfortable with that, but certainly if you want to pipe in with any strong feelings, now would be the time. 
I'm good. Okay, so the I'll put the motion. You're on good. The floor. Yeah. Okay, so we've got the motion on the floor. Uh, Trustee McNally's first amendment is to replace reasonably with directly related to the roles. Uh, number one, under guiding principles. To me, I think reasonably was just allowing a broader scope, which I think is what we had heard previously, what trustees wanted in terms of that. But um, so trust, let, we'll just go with trustee McNally's move that as an amendment. Is there any discussion on that? I can't tell if you're all frozen or just not. <laughs> No discussion. Oh no, maybe we are. Okay, so um, all those in favor of replacing reasonably with directly? Okay, you are all frozen, no. So I'm not seeing anybody raise their hand. Jordan, perhaps ask the other. Is all opposed. I don't know if all you're opposed. Are we still frozen on you? <laughs> I can all I can see is you and everybody else is frozen. Okay, oh. you have got everybody. I'm opposed. Everybody is opposed. All four. Okay, Trustee McAlley, should we move to the next one? Yep. Which is, uh, I think it's at 4A. Is that correct? Um, agreed to by rather than two trustees. Chair, could you just repeat that? I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing. He's at guiding principles number two. Yeah. She wanted annually instead of once in a four year term. Yep. Okay. Is there any discussion? And I'm, you guys are all frozen, so please speak up if you'd like. Elaine. Yes, Elaine. Um, we had talked about this before uh, a couple of times and that we would always be in a perpetual cycle of, uh, we'd hardly finish before we're starting again. And we thought that reasonably uh, it would be once in a four year, once in a four year term. Now, we also talked about the fact that if, after we've done it the first time, it seemed reasonable to do it more often than the first time after we've gone through a whole cycle and see how long it takes that we were, we were open to coming back and talking about revisions to this. So I think um, from the committee's perspective and then the feedback we got at the couple of discussions that we had, uh, we kept coming back to this as a reasonable way to start. Trustee Duncan, if you don't mind, Jordan, I'm gonna take the chair from you. Yeah, because I still can't see. Maybe yeah. I'll log off so, and log back so, in, okay? Sounds good. I'm going to go with Trustee Duncan and then Trustee Painter. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, what I wanted to say was um, I'm wondering how um, a four-year review cycle um, really meaningfully allows for um, an, any kind of um, meaningful uh, growth um, plan so where where there are areas of improvement um, identified um, if you're not reviewing um, a, a superintendent's performance until like you know four years out I don't see how you how you do that as a board um, I, I so I have an appetite definitely for looking at the review cycle and when that should occur with an eye to what's the best practice around reviewing and then um, instituting the growth plan and being able to track and monitor that. Um, and I think, you know, doing it once every four years doesn't, doesn't really allow for that. So, but I do appreciate the concern around there being fatigue if we were doing it so often that we literally completed it and we started it again. Um, but it's very commonplace to have annual review cycles. And I would say that at the executive le level that that's fairly, fairly normal. Thank you, Trustee Painter, and then uh, Rob Painter, and then Trustee Ryan Painter. Oh yeah, my first thought is that 
about to echo uh, Trustee Duncan, uh, annual reviews are the norm right across the provincial government. All employees receive annual reviews. So this is not something unusual in that regard. Uh, the other thing is that the, the superintendent's work changes on an ongoing basis. So uh, performance in one year doesn't necessarily reflect what's happening in the next year. So I think this is completely consistent with uh, ongoing oversight. Uh, the last point, and one that I have repeatedly attempted to make, is that the evaluation of the superintendent for the board is also the evaluation of the district performance. There's two things tied up here. One is the evaluation of the individual, the superintendent. The other thing is the evaluation of all of the work that is delegated to the superintendent which is all operational elements. So doing that on a four year plan, I think would be inadequate. The last point is that doing it once in a four year term puts it immediately into conflict with the superintendent contract, which states that the uh, superintendent will receive an annual performance review. So seeing as how we have an established legal contract with the superintendent, I think our policies should be consistent with that. Thank you, Trustee Brian Painter. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm I'm going to echo uh, what I heard from from Trustee Leonard, which is quite frankly, I I think it does not make much. I mean, I I've seen in my first two years as a trustee. Um, how much we've had to deal with who would have possibly imagined COVID-19 is something that could have come along and that that could have been something we had dealt with and who possibly could have imagined what the the boundary review was going to take us through I mean there's so much to look at in terms of a superintendent evaluation that I I can't see how an annual review is beneficial strictly speaking when we look at the evaluation and the performance of a superintendent, especially as Trustee Painter has said, there is so much change year in and year out. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate that that actually, to me, makes the argument why going to a four-year term, I think makes so much sense because there is so much change year in and year out. It makes more sense to have a macro look at the overall performance over a four-year cycle. Um, so I really do feel quite comfortable with having this at a four-year term um, to, to review and look at. And I will have no problem voting in favor of that when it comes to the board. Thank you, Trustee Painter. I do see the superintendent, Shelly Green. I also have a comment, so but I'll let uh, superintendent go first. I just wanted to clarify something that's in there that people might not have put together. So it, it provides for a written full evaluation of the performance um, within the four-year term, but the next page says it reflects areas of strength and growth and a, a growth plan that's reviewed on an annual basis. So it provides for both together. So the big picture, full written report, full review of absolutely everything, a growth plan that's going to be reviewed annually, just like you said, Trustee Painter. Thank you, Superintendent. So, and I would just uh, make my comment as well. Well, we're looking at guiding principles number two. The, the guiding, it's a guiding principle. Um, it actually says that the superintendent's performance will be at least once in every four year term, because in the past we couldn't pull it off in four year, every four years, um, with the preference being in the middle years, which when you look at a contract, uh, for me, I don't see annual as being worthwhile to go to all of our partner groups and whatnot, but I do see biannually as being something reasonable. And this does that. It puts us in the middle of her co of a uh, superintendent's contract about two years of review and then before another contract at four years, you would assume there would be another review. But um, uh, so my thought is I can't, I can't support wording there being changed to annual, um, but I do see that we, it does provide us with the opportunity to do more reviews. Um, and it sounds like in the next section that Superintendent Green mentioned, the mechanism to actually do that annual review is also in the document. So, so is there any other speakers to this? I thought I saw Trustee Leonard. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. go Trustee Leonard. 
Trustee Duncan and Trustee McNally, okay? Thank you. Uh, with regards to what Trustee Painter said about uh, it not um, being uh, in, be it, that it is in conflict with the uh, superintendent's contract, we had that discussion a couple of meetings ago or the last one that said um, if, it, if, if uh, this was agreed to um, in the wording that was here and we had to do any word changing of the superintendent's contract uh, to reflect that, she would certainly uh, be open to that uh, because we have to make those things work. If you're saying that we haven't, that we're in conflict with the contract, well, we haven't done it annually already. So we're trying to get our ducks in order. And if we have to do a wordsmithing and everybody's in agreement with the superintendent's contract to make it all work, then that was uh, talked about at that meeting that that would in fact happen. Thank you, and I see Trustee uh, Chair uh, Waters is back, so I will pass to her to pass to Trustee Duncan. Thank you, Chair, and welcome back, uh, Chair. Um, yeah, so I, I guess my my point um, around the timeline uh, in being like appreciating that the one um, a paragraph does allow for. Uh, at least once in a, in a four year uh, term and recommends that it be sort of midterm. So maybe the year two mark. And I do recognize also the, the paragraph that, that does speak to annually reviewing a growth plan. What I'm trying to point out is that if, if we say we follow the recommendation and we don't do it every year, we do it on the year two. What happens during those first two years? You, you develop a growth plan out of your evaluation of performance, right? So we're not gonna be doing any growth planning or any performance management for the first two years. And then at that point, we'll develop a growth plan, which will then monitor annually then from then on. Um, it, it just doesn't, to me, um, seem like, um, like it, like it would be really sustainable for a board to performance manage their you know key um, their CEO in that way, leaving sort of two years um, without any kind of uh, evaluation. I, I think it's I guess in my view, it, it's it's not fair to you know to leave an you know such a key employee or any employee unclear about how they're doing, um, let alone without a clear growth plan like right after the first year of performance has been completed. Um, but I, I accept that the rest of the committee, it sounds like um, doesn't have an appetite for approaching it in that way. Um, but I just wanted to clarify um, my point around the timeline and so on. Thanks, Trustee Duncan. I see Trustee McNally, did you wanna close? Was there anybody else in there, Chair? I just, are we missing anybody who is on the list ahead of me? No, I guess. Um, well, um, when Trustee Painter and I put together our uh, suggested mm, version of a superintendent's evaluation, we did a lot of research and um, Washington State and Oregon State have very, very robust superintendent evaluation policies, which I believe I provided to the board um, when we were on that committee. And somehow those superintendents managed to get through that very robust evaluation policy while holding down their superintendent job. I agree with Trustee Painter, COVID this year sent everything sideways, but um, you know, you can't plan for those, um, you plan for things to go forward. You don't plan that things will be disrupted. They inevitably they are, but you plan for the best and try to reach it. And uh, my other point is that we did sign off on a contract with the superintendent and if we as a board have fallen down on doing an annual performance review of the superintendent, that's on us. We don't go and change the contract that we signed off on because we have fallen down. We make a massive effort to live up to what we signed off on, what we expected to do and what our superintendent um, expected to participate in when we both signed this contract. So I hope you will support uh, a change to annual. Thank you so much. So the question on the floor is, do we change their guiding principles number two from a four year, at least once in a four year trustee term to annual? And I'll call the question. All those in favor? 
And that's trustee Rob Painter, all those opposed. And that is the remaining four trustees. So the motion to amend fails. And I'll turn the floor back over to trustee McNally. Thank you, uh, Chair, as you've been leading us through the rest of them. I thought you might lead us through this one too, but I'm looking at uh, guiding principles four. We'll utilize the following. And in point A, rather than uh, agreed upon an anonymous leadership survey tool agreed upon by two trustees, um, who knows who those two trustees are at this point. Um, at any rate, I feel that that's, uh, that's not enough of a that doesn't demonstrate the will of the board. So I would like to see a majority of trustees, uh, a mechanism for a majority of trustees to agree on the anonymous leadership survey tool. So I proposed my amendment, sorry, I put my rationale ahead of my uh, amendment. It's just to change two to a majority of. Okay, any speakers to the amendment? Trustee Whitaker. Thank you. The, the concern that Trustee McNally is making, I think what needs to be clarified is that there will be two trustees appointed to do this work. And these are the two trustees that we're talking about. Um, so I don't see changing this without having to change everything else in the document. And the fact is, is that this needs to have two trustees, there needs to be a committee moving it forward and then bringing all of the information to the board. So I can't support that because I do support there being a committee of two trustees working forward on this. Trustee Duncan? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, might I suggest, because I, I think what Trustee McNally is getting at comes up under the process section as well. Um, I believe it's at one, two, three, um, and possibly four. Um, and I'm wondering if a pragmatic solution might be to suggest an amendment to the amendment, um, whereby we, we simply, um, and again, taking into account also what Trustee Whitaker has pointed out, what we simply um, ask the two First of all, the, the trustees that have been appointed, that it's by um, that the, the board appoints them, and then secondly, um, that once the board appoints those two trustees to work with the superintendent to manage this process, that all the recommendations and all the decisions that would come back to the board for final approval. So, might I suggest an amendment to the amendment? Chair, so so I'm sorry, I don't understand the amendment to the amendment. Yeah, do you mind uh, repeating that, Nicole? Yep. Just the sure. yep. summary. So, so um, in in relation to the first part, uh, the the board will appoint two trustees. And then coming back to Trustee Whitaker's point, um, at, at under process, at one, two, three, and four, that the two trustees in consultation with the superintendent will make a recommendation to the board. That, that would be the wording. Sorry, let me go back to the document, and give you the actual page count here. So it's at page twenty nine and thirty. So under process, and each so for instance at number one, um, each of these sort of paragraphs they. They have some wording at the end that says that the, that the two trustees appointed by the chair and the superintendent uh, will make um, decisions about the process. And what I'm recommending is that we um, amend those sections so that the two trustees in consultation with the superintendent would make recommendations to the board. 
rather than taking unilateral decisions. So you see the committee developing the survey tool and bringing it to a board meeting? That's right. Yeah, to to, to, exactly. And then the same thing with um, number two, again, under process, um, the two appointed trustees and the superintendent will appoint an external consultant that is mutually agreeable to the parties, the parties being the, the two trustees and the superintendent and each uh, and such consultants estimated cost will be reported to the board. What I'm saying is then again, the same would apply. So the, the two appointed trustees and the superintendent would make recommendations to the board about uh, who to appoint as a consultant um, not just simply the cost, but who to appoint and come back to the board for a final decision. Um, I think that would allow as well for the, the board to take uh, some ownership around making sure that um, our procurement processes are followed as well, um, rather than appointing that we acknowledge that we also have some procurement processes that would need to be adhered to as we undertake that process. And I think it's probably more appropriate to have the, the board approve that expenditure because I know consultants can be pretty pricey and presumably um, our, our procurement process would, would kick in there as well. Okay, who would like to, would anybody like to speak to the amendment to the amendment? Uh, Trustee Painter, Ryan Painter, I saw you indicate, but perhaps you're not speaking to the amendment to the amendment. I might, but I believe Trustee Leonard actually indicated it before I did, so I'll let her go first. Trustee Leonard. Thank you. Uh, we had talked a lot about this at the committee level. At, yeah, when uh, Trustee Waters and I were on the committee, and um, um, we we envisioned that the board would set a range of cost for a consultant ahead of time so that the committee would always be working within, that's the first issue, would always be working within whatever the cost item, the cost amount was that the board set aside for that. But uh, we have um, in the last, last part of Trustee uh, Duncan's comments, we have gone to consultants for a variety of things uh, based on their, um, their past experience, based on what they've done, based on their um, employment history, whatever, not going to procurement um, through a procur procurement process. So I don't see that that's an issue. Um, the chair, one of my other points was the chair makes recommendations to committee appointments all the time. And so this would just be another uh, extension of the, um, the chair's um, committee process. So superintendent's evaluation committee basically is what it comes down to. So I don't see an issue with the chair um, uh, appointing two trustees, she would call for who's interested and then appoint them as she does uh, as the chair, he or she does at any at any point in time. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I can't support changing this right now because I think uh, we're trying to have a streamlined process which gets the job done, which doesn't keep getting it bogged down at the board level and we can bring you a process by which then you can say, um, when you're having an external consultant, that really takes it away from the trustees um, being involved in the actual evaluation other than instigating the process and moving the process along. So I think um, I'm, I'm happy, well, I'm happy with the way it's worded right now. And uh, as I said before, if we decide after the first go round, this is not what we want and it's not giving us the, rec the uh, required outcome that we're looking for, then certainly we can come back and revisit it. Thank you. I've got trustee Ryan Painter and then trustee Rob Painter speaking to the amendment to the amendment. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna be very quick. I agree with what trustee Leonard said. I'll pass, thank you. Trustee Rob Painter. While I'll speak, while I am in favor of the amendment to the amendment, I, I honestly think that we've gotten so far off track here that I, I can't even quite figure things out. Personally, if we're getting an external consultant to conduct the interviews, then in my mind, all that we really need to do here is an anonymous leadership survey tool, but it's being, it's, it's based on questions that are coming out of the 
out of the pool, we could easily do that in 15, 20 minutes at, a, at an in-camera board meeting, show of hands, what are the five questions that we all agree to, or at least the majority agree to, done, let the external consultant go out and do the rest of the work, get out of the, the business of, of cherry picking one or two trustees, it's either the whole board or it's not. And while it's one thing for the chair to select members of the committee, all those committees always come back to the board to provide recommendations to the board. And it, by that structure, everyone on the board still gets a say, still is part of the decision-making process. Here, we're talking about two trustees going out and doing a whole bunch of work on their own, well, with the superintendent apparently, and then coming back and giving us a finished product that is then accepted, I guess. So it's a very different situation from the committee structure. And I personally think if we've got an external consultant in there, let's give the work, all the work to the external consultant and quit with splitting stuff out. I just want to point out that the splitting stuff out came at the direction of the board previously. And that's how we got to that. Uh, Trustee Whitaker. Thank you. Uh, lots of really good points being raised. Um, so because there's so much going on in this motion, I can't support it, but I will say that I do agree. I, I believe that under process number one, should be the same process that we do for other committees, regardless of, you know, I mean, if this doesn't work, you can choose to do elections later, but currently that the chair uh, is, um, does appoint trustees. I think in consultation with the superintendent could be struck, but it's irrelevant, I guess. Uh, but number two, uh, which trustee Duncan has raised that um, two trustees will choose a consultant, regardless if there was an amount chosen in the budget that was already approved, that particular um, part of the process, that's not our practice. Our practice is that a recommendation is made to the board. So I would, um, I could support that particular guideline being changed just because that is our practice. That is how we have done it. Um, that the two would perhaps meet with the superintendent, three, there would be a ma matrix made up with three whatever, and then we would vote on the consultant, and then as Trustee Painter says, then we run with them, and then I don't want the board involved at all, but I think to keep with our practices, it would be reasonable that the board would approve the consultant that was hired. So those are my thoughts, but because the everything's all tangled up in one motion, I can't support that. I don't know if somebody wants to. Okay, yeah. let's um, deal with the amendment to the amendment and see where we're at. And then we can go from there and we can certainly entertain whatever other amendments are coming forward. So all those in favor of the amendment to the amendment, all those opposed? So that was trustee Rob Painter in um, favor and the balance opposed. So the motion fails. So we're back to the amendment. Trustee McNally. Yes, Chair, if I could just uh, uh, point out that, um, <laughs> Sorry, four, we utilize the following and the anonymous survey tool agreed upon by the two, uh, majority of trustees um, that's connected to process number one, where the board is going to elect two trustees. So um, yeah, it's different, different processes there. So just back to a majority of trustees rather than two in order to select the uh, anonymous survey tool. We're at 4A for that amendment, correct? Two trustees to a majority. Okay, all those in favor of the amendment? Trustee Painter, all those opposed? 
And that's the balance of trustees. So we're back to the policy as presented. Um, I know Trustee McNally has other amendments, so I'm happy just to turn it over to her unless there's anybody else who's wanting to get a kick at the can. Okay, Trustee McNally. Thank you, Chair. There's only two more. Uh, process number one, uh, the chair in consultation with the superintendent, strike that uh, and uh, just uh, replace it with the board will elect two trustees. So that's it for process number one. Okay, so we're not appointing, we're electing two trustees. Any speakers to the amendment? Trustee Leonard and then Trustee Duncan. Just that I think we've already talked about this uh, a second ago to say that our practice is that the chair appoints um, trustees to committees right now. So I'm happy with the wording the way it is right now. Thank you. Trustee Duncan. Yeah, I'll just be brief chair. I, I think that this committee is unique uh, in that it is the committee, our committee that we are using in order to evaluate our CEO. Um, and I think that a, a higher level of um, board involvement um, throughout the process um, would be in order given the, the nature of what the committee is, is doing. Um, and I think it was Trustee Painter, Rob Painter who pointed out that unlike this committee, other committees would come back up through an appropriate standing committee, if it was an ad hoc committee or up through to the board and the full board would at the end of the day need to vote in, in favor of whatever the action or recommendation um, is. And we're not really seeing that level of um, board input um, with this. Chair, if I could make a closing comment. Certainly, if there are no other speakers, which I don't see, please go ahead. Okay, I'm um, just to address that it has been our process for the chair to uh, appoint um, true, but whenever we see an opportunity for increased democratic involvement, I believe uh, we should take it. And this is an opportunity to do exactly that for the board to elect rather than to have the chair appoint Okay, all those in favor of changing um, a point to elect under process number one. All those in favor? All those opposed? And so that looks like the same split once more, correct? So Chair, that um, obviates my last um, proposed amendment, and the number two, because that was going to be the two elected chairs and uh, the committee has chosen not to support uh, elected trustees. So um, we'll just leave that one alone. Okay, uh, Trustee Whitaker, did you want to change under process two? Um... Yeah, we can do that. I think what, uh... Actually, I think if you asked, uh, let's give this to Trustee Ryan Painter to do. Trustee Painter. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair and, and Chair. Uh, yeah, so um, my thoughts are to add in um, after the two appointed trustees and the superintendent, after the after superintendent add upon approval of the board. So just add that after superintendent between superintendent and will. And I think that clears up this concern, at least hopefully. So it would read that the two appointed trustees and the superintendent upon approval of the board will appoint an external consultant that is mutually agreeable to both parties and such consultants estimated costs will be reported to the board. Could we not just strike the last Sure. For our part, because if sure. we're yeah, upon yeah, yeah. approval, then we don't need to report Upon it. approval and strike the, and end at parties and then okay, strike the remainder. Thank you. thank you for that amendment. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the amendment? And that's unanimous. Okay, so we're back to the policy. As amended, Trustee Painter, Ryan, or Rob Painter, sorry. Do 
You're muted, Rob. I do my best work while muted. Uh, my concern, and I have expressed this in the past, uh, but it's still a concern, is that uh, this entire section, in my mind, uh, leaves the superintendent open to charges of conflict of interest all the way through. The idea that the superintendent uh, will know uh, everyone who is uh, submitting an evaluation, that the superintendent gets to select the questions that will be asked of the superintendent's performance, uh, just about the whole thing. The superintendent, uh, while there may be some rule in having a conversation in advance, about uh, interests and concerns or something of that nature. Uh, all the rest of this stuff is straight textbook conflict of interest in my mind and uh, is highly problematic. So I would see striking and the superintendent, uh, I think striking the superintendent in number one, in number two, and the superintendent is struck uh, in number three, uh, things like BC PAC executive as chosen by the two trustees and superintendent, strike the end superintendent, superintendent all the way through. So if to do otherwise is basically giving anyone who wants to uh, be critical of the process, complete license to point out that the, the person being reviewed had complete control of their own review. So it, it makes it a meaningless process. Okay, any speakers to the amendment? I'll open up the floor before I weigh in. Can you be more clear exactly what you're amending, Rob? He just, Sorry. he wants to take out the superintendent so that this is a process that is done to the superintendent, not with the superintendent. So it would remove and the superintendent from all aspects of the process. Section one, is that correct? There's probably some nuance, nuances, but I think that's the gist of it. Can I ask, did we strike um in number one in consultation with the superintendent we already did that right we didn't no we haven't we have not done anything other than change the the hiring the consultant process oh okay sorry it's getting confusing and to me if i'll take the floor here um having been a part of of evaluative processes professionally. I mean, it's not a conflict of interest. This is how you do productive evaluations together. That's the whole point. It's not a thing that is done to. Uh, Robin, Ms. Tozak. Thanks, Chair. Um, just because we're, the amendment is dealing with this section, um, Usually, um, in almost every practice in the district, when there's um, appointment of teachers to committees or um, like to working groups and that sort of thing, generally the practice is um, that the union would select who those representatives are. Um, I can't really think of an example where someone would be selected as representing the GBTA, but the GBTA wouldn't select that person. So I would respectively request that that be the case in this process as well, that rather than the um, the teachers or the union executive staff, and I'm not sure if teachers would be included in both of those, um, but that the, that the GBTA um, have the same ability here that we have in other, in all the other settings to select the, uh, the GBTA members that would represent the association. Okay, I take your point, but it is sort of out of order in terms of what's on the floor currently. So I'd like to just deal with the removing and superintendent from all aspects of the process. 
If there, I'm seeing no further speakers. So I'll call the question, all those in favor? All those opposed, so that was trustee Rob Painter in favor and the balance of trustees opposed. So the motion fails. Are there any other amendments to the policy? Trustee Rob Painter? Uh, just following up on uh, what Robin mentioned under three uh, bullet for teachers, uh, uh, teachers that the superintendent has worked with and afterwards as selected by the GVTA. Okay, any speakers to the motion? Sorry, I had to think Trustee on Whitaker? that. Yeah. Okay, so I, I really, I get the point that everybody is trying to make. And when I read it without the context of the entire document, I get the same rub that I think that trustees are, are, are pointing to. And, you know, it, it, I can see them being removed and it doesn't change anything um, to the document. Um, but I think we start, I mean, anyway, here's my challenge is that the point of putting as selected by the two trustees and the superintendent is not to say that the superintendent is going to pick all of those or that the trustee is going to pick on those. I mean, and I get that maybe the wording could have been a bit different. It's to appoint the responsibility to make sure that this happens. Um, and yeah, I can see as chosen by two trustees and the su superintendent that I would support striking in there all of those because I can see our ind indigenous leaders, they're going to have a say. But the, con the idea was, I believe, is that the superintendent and two trustees would choose the organizations and the organizations themselves would then choose who would answer the questions. And if I'm wrong, um, then we definitely need to change the wording. But I do believe, and maybe the committee members can, can confirm to me, but that is what I believe the intent is, is that this would be that the organizations would then be contacted. Can someone yes. confirm that? Yeah. Yeah, no, certainly. And because I'm just looking if we were to do that, if the amendment were to go through for the teachers, then which other groups does it need to apply to also? And obviously, I can't like for a VC PAC executive, obviously, that would be in conversation with the VC PAC executive, the DLT, it's all members, principals, again, I mean, I assume it would be in consultation. So so um, I think there's I think there's merit to remove that, like to just yeah. leave VC PAC executive to remove the ter the words as chosen by two trustees and a superintendent, because the two trustees and the superintendent would never go to an organization, one of our partners, and say, well, we're going to give this to Jody, but we're not going to give it to Crystal. Like, we're not going to do that. No, this we're not going to do that. Exactly. So why don't you amend the amendment to yeah. strike? To strike those words in section two only. I think Miss Trustee Painter, Rob Painter's amendment was through the whole thing. Um, no, that so that amendment failed and the amendment that's on the table now yeah. is to change the bullet teachers under process number three. So what I'm wondering is if you would like to move that we strike as chosen by after each of those points other than yes, DLT which is all members. Yes, and then obviously the responsibility rests with the superintendent evaluation committee to make those contacts and identify the, the people to do the, the survey. And then under four, of course, you're doing, it's very specific who needs to be there. Yeah. So can we call that the an amendment to the amendment, Trustee Whitaker? 
I'm good with that. As long as you keep under other to be discussed with the two trustee yeah. representatives. Other stays the same and DLT all members stays the same and the rest we strike as chosen by. Yeah. Are there any speakers to the amendment to the amendment? Trustee Duncan? Um, I just have to say I'm relieved that we're seeing some amendments go through and I think this is an obvious one um, and I'm really, really pleased to see that there's some support on the committee for it. Um, I, I, I think it's, you know, it would be an absurd situation to have um, two trustees and, and, and a superintendent telling our partner groups um, who, who they're going to, uh, who's going to participate on their behalf. So I absolutely support the amendment to the amendment. Well, to be clear, that wasn't the that was process that anybody ever envisioned. So we're just clarifying in here so that it, it reflects more accurately what was envisioned. Trustee McNally, did you want to speak to the amendment to the amendment? Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to speak to the point that's being uh, made a few uh, times here, which is that as chosen by two trustees and the superintendent doesn't actually mean as chosen by two trustees and the superintendent. Um, I find that a real stretch to say that as chosen by two trustees and the superintendent doesn't mean that. So in future, let's be cognizant of how we word things, not what we meant to say, but let's actually say that. So okay. I'm too complete Thank you. Amendment. Point taken. What I think what happened here, though, is that in many of the other visits to the committee, that this section, uh, we're looking for specificity. And that sometimes happens in developing policies that you get really specific. And then it turns out you don't actually want to be that specific. Because I know there was a big discussion around who, who gets you. So now we're pulling it back. And I think I feel good about it. And I think the amendment to the amendment is going to pass. So let's find out. All those in favor of the amendment to the amendment? Any opposed? None. So that was unanimous. And then I guess we're back to the amendment, which has now changed. Do we have to vote on that twice? It's officially nine o'clock. Uh, I believe Robin was trying to get your attention. Okay, sure, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just am looking at the list and uh, the bullet union executive staff, I think would be more accurate if it um, just said union executive members. Um, we generally don't think of ourselves as being the union staff. Um, but I also, when I was thinking about that piece, realized that the, um, and I'm not sure if Jeanette or another rep is here from ASA, but the allied specialists aren't um, included in this list because they're not a uh, union, but they are one of the employee groups. Okay, can we make all, I think we can just make that a friendly amendment because that is what we meant is for it to say union and ASA executive members. I can't see anybody having any challenge with that. Can we make that a friendly amendment or would you like a vote on it? You could even just list the, really it's four groups, GBTA, yeah. QP94732 and ASA. We just might do that, Robin. That would be, <laughs> total, that would make it totally clear. Yeah, it would make it totally clear. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Kim, did you get that? That change? Okay, I think that's pretty straightforward. Is there anything else? Or can we move this forward to the board and then I'm sure we'll have the pleasure of doing this again in two weeks. Okay, all those in favor of approving the superintendent evaluation policy as amended. Although, so that's uh, myself, Trustee Whitaker, Henson Leonard in favor, all those opposed. Trustee Rob Painter. Okay, so the motion carries. This has been a year's worth of work. I'm excited to see what happens at the board. Um, and I do want to just remind everybody that the plan is, is that once the evaluation, first evaluation process is completed, that we will be reviewing the policy as a matter of course. 
so that we make sure that it does meet the needs of the board. Okay. Chair, if I uh, could have your permission to leave the meeting just for a couple of minutes, I'll be right back. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we've already done, look at that. I've, I already got rid of H2. So we're on to H3, which is the Safe Design Council Certification Funding, Trustee Painter. Thank you very much, Chair. So I will just read from the memo that was provided and my thanks to uh, Superintendent Morris and Andre for helping get this out this morning. It was a rush to get all this information together and try to provide it in time for members of the committee. So um, I have facilitated connections with members of the board of the Safe Design Council, which is a national not-for-profit organization that utilizes peer-reviewed and internationally recognized crime reduction through design program. The purpose of and the intent of the Safe Design Standard is to implement a point-based certification program, which aims to achieve enhanced site building security through functional planning, landscape architecture, architecture, engineering, interior design, and space programming. I've worked with Secretary Treasurer Morris on the idea, and she's reached out to the Director of Facilities, Chuck Morris, who has expressed support for the project and has worked with similar design principles in the past. Very handy person to have knowledgeable uh, uh, here with us tonight. From the discussions with the Safe Design Council, we've learned that there is a potential for a pilot project here in our school district for one or two schools to implement the Safe Design Standard. The grant will be utilized to complete a risk assessment as it relates to safety and crime. We'll, be, we'll provide fully 3D scaled rendered interactive models of our potential sites for SD61 staff's future use. Safe design personnel will review the assessment. They'll train our staff personnel on their design principles. They'll submit, uh, we'll submit for compliance for the standard uh, deficiencies and recommendations for mediation and then we'll be certified. Funds will come from a partnership with the federal and provincial government and will be provided to the district to bring the implementation of the design work and training for our pilot projects. So um, there's as well uh, an attachment from the Safe Design Council that goes through essentially why this is so important. But what really the project will do is it will provide evidence-based, standardized and re replicable model to increase school safety through security. Um, and it will enhance uh, students' uh, safety for students, teachers, and staff. Um, will support our district's ability to meet their duty of care by improving protection of occupants, and will help school districts to identify and mitigate potential risks. So I, I actually first learned about safe design several years ago, and as a um, uh, a student of, of physical and architectural geography, uh, safe design has been something that's been a bit of a prep project for me um, in terms of its interest and its potential for our school district and we could, if this motion passes and we're able to move forward, receive up to potentially $135,000 um, to host this pilot project at one or potentially two sites within the district. Um, and we would potentially be a model that the rest of the province would then follow. So the uh, motion I have for you tonight, and I'll, I'll read it if you, uh, if you would like, uh, Madam Chair, um, that the Board of Education of School District Number 61 directs staff to make application for federal or provincial grant funding to undertake Safe Design Council certification for a new replacement or retro capital project at no cost to the board. And further, that staff secure letters of support from the Ministries of Education and Public Safety and Solicitor General to support relevant grant applications. So. Chair, I don't know if we want to bring in the Secretary Treasurer and um, Director Morris to maybe chat about this, but I, I the motion uh, I'll put and I'll leave it to you to direct. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is it possible to go back to the view so we can see all our folks? Hopefully you've all seen the motion. Thank you so much. Uh, Secretary Treasurer, did you want to speak to this? No, I have nothing to add. The rationale is there and uh, presented. Okay, uh, any speakers to the motion? Trustee Leonard? Um, I, just have a, I just have a question. Um, it says that uh, you get provincial grant funding to undertake the certification. So um, the certification would be after the project is completed, I would imagine. 
you can't, you, they would design and do everything, but you wouldn't get certified until the project is fully completed. And the, it looked like to me, the funds covered when I read the, your, the handout that came uh, a little while ago, uh, it looked like um, the funding was for the consultant and to the work up to take to you to tell you what you needed in order to make your school safe. But does it it also include what comes after to actually implement the safe school and all the work that would be required, whether it's landscaping or whether it's um, construction of some sort. Because um, so at no cost to the board, is there a capital cost to us after to get the certification? Sorry about the long winded question. Trustee Painter. Uh, I, I can answer that as best my understanding, and then I'm happy to, to flip to uh, Secretary Treasury if, I, if I've gotten anything wrong. Um, so uh, the answer is that school district staff are trained in the safe design standard and that certification, recertification will, so the initial certification comes and then uh, uh, the building and the design phase happens. So what happens is the consultant is essentially brought in to work with our, the work with the architects of the plan. Um, so for example, they would go into a space if it were a remediation or a rebuild, they would do the 3D modeling of it. And then they would work with the architect to certify that standard with the architect and then move that standard forward. For a rebuild, it would probably be a little bit different, um, but the process is still essentially there in terms of training our staff in the safe design principles. The only other thing that would happen is there would be a recertification to maintain safe design standard after five years. But my understanding from the council is that that will be looped into the funding that comes from the federal and provincial government, uh, which is to help us maintain that recertification in the safe standard model. Um, but I'm happy to flip to the secretary treasurer if I've gotten anything wrong with that. Just, and if I've not answered your question, which is can possible. Can I just have a quick follow-up? Can, yep. can I just a uh, chair? Yeah, go ahead, please. Um, so to get LEED certification, from my understanding, as an example, you don't get certification until you've reached, you've finished your you finished everything and then you get certified. So that's what I'm saying is the, you'll have the consultant, they'll train our staff, they'll tell us what we need to do. And then there, it sounds to me like there would still be capital cost beyond that, that we would have to incur. And that, that's, what, that's my question. Sure, and if I may chair? Please go ahead. Sure, and, that, and that's a fair question. The understanding that I have from Safe Design Council um, from my conversations with them is that the full costs, and they're looking for the full cost of the certification and the programming that they would be providing to the district to come from uh, the, first, the first program, which would be from the Ministry of Education, and the second program, which would be from the uh, um, capital uh, uh, re recuperation program or the civil forfeiture program. So all of this in terms of the certification uh, from what Safe Design has told me and their work with Solicitor General and Ministry of Education is coming from them in the form of a grant to us and that there is no capital outlay for us. But again, I'm happy to flip to the Secretary Treasurer if I've gotten any of this wrong. Uh, sure, I'll speak to it. I think I understand uh, Trustee Leonard's question um, and it is the same with leads. If uh, you work with your architects and your engineers and they um, suggest that to meet the lead certification, it's going to cost you uh, half a million dollars. Uh, that's a that's a a cost that the construction or the uh, director of capital projects, Jim, would have to decide if it's within his budget or not. And if it wasn't, we'd have to come to the board. Uh, similar to um, uh, net zero. So if net zero at uh, Cedar Hill is going to cost us two million dollars, we need to come to the board and say it's going to cost two million dollars. Do you want to spend that money? Um, it's similar here. Uh, we would work with our architects and engineers under the design principles. And if we were able to deliver the um, certification within the construction budget allotted by the ministry, uh, then we would do so. If there were any incremental costs, we would bring them to the board. But we anticipate, given that it may be uh, landscaping or, um, I don't know, some other design element that we're hopeful that um, that can live within the existing engineering and architecture budgets. And if it didn't, we'd have to make a decision with the board's help. Thank you. Uh, I, had, I had Robin and then we'll go to Trustee McNally. I'll pass, thanks. Trustee McNally. 
Thank you, Shomi Akulpa, for missing uh, the rationale to uh, my colleague, Ryan Painter. Um, I'm looking at the uh, Safe Design Standard website here. And so this is uh, the security achieved through functional environmental design is a scholarly based crime reduction through design methodology. Is that right? Is that what we're talking about? Thank you that's, so much. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, seeing no more discussion on the motion, which again, I'll just read it, is that the board directs staff to make an application for federal or provincial grant funding to undertake Safe Design Council certification for a new replacement or retrofit capital project at no cost to the board. And further that staff secure letters of support from the ministries of education, public safety and solicitor general to support relevant grant applications. All those in favor? Let's see, I can't see everybody. So, uh, all those opposed? Is that unanimous? I can't. Where, where are you beautiful people? There you are. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, so that is unanimous. Thank you so much for your patience. And thank you, Trustee Painter, for bringing that to the committee. And now we'll go to H4, which is SJ Burnside Upgrade Project, Trustee Duncan. Thank you, Chair. So did you want me to read the motion, Chair? I assume everybody has it on their, um, well, you can read it if you want. Save me from reading it later. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so the, the Board of Education of School District 61 direct the audit committee to review the SJ Burnside upgrade project from the fiscal year 2018-19 and 2019-20 and provide the Board of Education a report that identifies the following. And so this is one through eight. Number one, the budget allocated to the SJ Burnside upgrade project in all relevant fiscal years. Two, the expenses and the resulting surplus or deficit for each fiscal year. Three, the work that is outstanding to date. Four, the budget and cost management processes in place during the SJ Burnside upgrade project. Five, reporting and monitoring measures in place during the SJ Burnside project. Six, external reporting standards in place during the SJ Burnside upgrade project. Seven, all steps taken to enforce financial controls and to mitigate financial risks to the school district during the SJ Burnside upgrade project. And eight, the audit committee's recommendations regarding possible areas of improvement to dis district risk management, sorry, risk assessment, risk management and internal financial controls. So um, I'm bringing this motion forward uh, with a mind to the fact that we are embarking on the largest capital project to date at Vic High. Um, in my view, it, it would be prudent at this stage to review the last big capital project that we undertook at SJ Burnside uh, in order to assess possible areas of improvement to our risk management um, and internal financial controls. Uh, I see this as an opportunity to demonstrate our board's commitment to continuous improvements. Um, the direction provided in the motion is certainly in line with the audit committee's responsibility to assist our board with financial oversight responsibilities. Uh, namely, the purpose of the audit committee is to assist our board in fulfilling its oversight responsibilities for financial reporting process, the system of internal controls, risk assessment and mitigation strategies internal and external audit function and compliance matter, uh, matters, such as our compliance with policy and legislative requirements. The audit committee is charged with internal control and risk management as responsible for assessing risk matters and determining the adequacy of our risk mitigation strategies uh, implemented by management. So the report set out in the motion will assist our board to ensure it is meeting its obligations to carry out projects in a manner that ensures delivery within budget, completion on time, and that the project scope is fully met upon completion. The report will also assist us to assess our practice complies with policies and best practices related to capital uh, project procurement, 
as documented in the Capital Asset Management Framework and the Capital Procurement Checklist published by the Ministry of Finance. And so I'd ask my colleagues to consider the motion and uh, consider supporting it. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Leonard, did you want to speak to the motion? I did. I just wanted to, to know from the Secretary Treasurer's point of view, um, the audit committee, as to my knowledge, has not undertaken something along this line, but I'm not sure if the TOR supports it or if this, this is just actually a staff report that we're requesting. Maybe um, she could give me some insight here. Uh, sure. Um, I think it can go either way. Um, Either way, I think staff's going to either be bringing it to this committee or to the audit committee, which will bring it to this committee. So uh, I don't think it matters either way. What's important here is um, is the uh, the fact that it it is a, a motion, which um, I I think is a is a good learning uh, for us. Um, it will take some time. Uh, either way, either committee it gets sent to will require some staff time, and hence the reason we're asking for uh, boards board direction here. Um, I don't know if Katrina wants to comment on the terms of reference for the audit committee. She certainly served on it longer than I have, so I don't know if she's still here. She is. <laughs> Katrina, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, my only comment would be that um, we do bring bring items and discuss con internal controls and this motion does touch on that piece. Um, I, I agree with Kim. I feel that if this report is done, whether it goes to the audit committee first, it will end up at ops and ultimately um, to the board. So I think uh, either way is probably fine from my perspective. Excellent. Are there any other speakers to the motion? Trustee Leonard, sorry if you weren't finished. Yeah, sorry. I just want, I had a further point was that uh, um, I know that Trustee Duncan has alluded to the fact that um, this might give us insight into Vic High because that's a major project coming up. I guess I would say that probably looking at how well we did at the Oak Bay build would certainly give us better indication as to how we would do with Vikai, because again, it was a complete, complete rebuild, as opposed to um, the upgrade project. So, um, I think from staff's perspective and reporting that we had from the board on the Oak Bay project, um, we were pretty, pretty skookum there. So, just, just heads up on that. Trustee Rob Painter. I do think there, there's some, some definite opportunities to, to learn some, some points and just uh, to refresh all of us on, on such things as internal financial controls, et cetera. One of the things that, that just uh, in response to Trustee Leonard's comment about uh, Oak Bay, I certainly agree that uh, just on, on the number, on, on the quantum uh, merits, th those two are, are closely linked. Where I think uh, Burnside might be uh, useful is that uh, this is a very recent project. And so what we'll be able to see there is uh, our current um, financial practices. I know that there were some, some changes internally uh, under the former secretary treasurer. I think it would be useful to uh, uh, really have a sense of where we stand right now as far as uh, our measures and controls are. Okay, any other speakers to the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that's uh, all those opposed? So that was unanimous. Trustee Leonard, did you vote in favor? Are you abstaining? I think I'm going to abstain on that one. Okay. 
So the four trustees in favor and then trustee Leonard abstaining. So the motion carries. And now we are in the home stretch as we turn to H5, which is trustee painters uh, motion. Uh, Rob Painter, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much. And right off the bat, I do apologize for for springing this on everyone at uh, at the well, not quite the eleventh hour, the six fifty fifth hour. Uh, it's something that's been on my mind uh, the last little while, and uh, I wanted to be able to. Uh, oh, there we are. Um, present this primarily to be able to undertake the conversation and uh, and secondarily to see if we can uh, make a, a positive step forward uh, with respect to uh, some of the bigger issues that we're seeing in the news right now. So the, uh, the motion that the Board of Education uh, School District number 61, Greater Victoria, direct the equity committee to undertake discussions uh, with members of the school community, including, and I should have said, but not limited to, uh, racialized Indigenous LGBTQ staff, parents, and students to, one, determine what, if any, concerns there may be with the district school police liaison officer program, and apparently another one uh, that I can't do very well, uh, develop recommendations as required on what changes should be made to the program to improve its value to the school community. Uh, I, I'm very much aware that uh, that my own perspectives on uh, the merits of the, the school liaison officer program uh, are going to be impacted by my own lived experience and my white privilege. Uh, so I think it it would be really uh, useful to engage members of uh, other communities uh, within our broader school community, we use that word a lot, uh, to actually find out what the broad range of perspectives is uh, to determine whether or not we do have any concerns and uh, where concerns exist or perhaps opportunities for improvement, that we make those opportunities uh, and we take advantage of those opportunities. One thing that I would go one point further on this one uh, is just to really uh, consider what the role of the uh, of the school liaison officer program is. It was one thing that I was uh, just contemplating myself. I'm not actually able to find any policies or regulations uh, speaking to it. I don't know if we have any documentation actually about what our goals were when we first set out uh, to initiate the the program but i think that that's something that uh, would be worthwhile as well in a bigger scope so thank you very much thank you trusty painter any speakers to the motion uh trustee whitaker and then trustee leonard thank you uh one i do think that the amendment that you had said that you meant to put in there should be in there uh, not limited to since you were first moving it. Um, I like the direction that this is going. I, what I'm hearing uh, from Trustee Painter as well as from other trustees and people in the community is that we need more information about this program. I'm hearing comments made by school trust or by some of our trustees that show that we don't understand the program. We don't understand who's funding the program. We don't understand where it was. Um, what the roles of these positions are and the, the benefits or not benefits that they are providing that I, I highly support moving this discussion to an area where it can be deeply looked at um, and and broadly reviewed. So I, I can support this going to equity. Uh, Trustee sure. Leonard and then Trustee Duncan. Yeah, I can support it as so in behind my little screens here. I think I might be missing some words. So it's, it, are we discussing this with the broader school community as well as racialized indigenous and LBTQ, LB, LGBTQ staff, students, and parents as well? So where is that wording? 
Trustee Painter? Yeah, yes, I apologize for the, the confusion. And I think by inserting after including comma, but not limited to comma, I think that would make it more clear. Uh, my intention was to uh, propose a broad-based engagement, but to specifically seek out uh, members of communities who, uh, I'm making your gross assumption here, may have had uh, less positive interactions with uh, uh, police than say I have. <clears throat> Thank you for that clarification. I, I would support this going forward. Thank you, Trustee Leonard. Uh, Robin? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm very much in support of this uh, motion in terms of doing this sort of review of the program and um, as others have mentioned, kind of establishing how, where the program originated and what the relationship is and what the expectations are in the program and then further to sort of delve into um, where uh, members of the school community see value in the program, but also where they see that it, it may be as problematic or um, could be improved um, or maybe is not something that's helpful. Um, so I, I really, um, I'm in support of that review and I'm glad that it uh, specifically identifies members of the school community that may um, may see fewer benefits or may see harms done through um, the school police liaison program. I am, um, the, the piece that I'm a little bit concerned about is having the equity committee do this work. I've been on the equity committee for since the beginning of the equity committee and things move very slowly there, it seems. And so I think sending, tasking this to the equity committee, um, <laughs> you're, I don't anticipate you seeing um, a results or information coming back quickly. Um, I'm not sure what a more efficient or direct process would be, but um, I think there probably is one that's possible within the school district um, and maybe the equity committee has a role to play in reviewing um, those results or having um, like being inserted into the process along the way. But I think if the equity committee is the only place where this, this work happens, um, it will take quite a few months to get something out, gather and get something meaningful back. But I'm very much in support of any something that gets this conversation going. Thank you. I'll go to Trustee Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I will keep it brief. I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Trustee Rob Painter for bringing this forward. I know that it is um, a conversation that is um, needed and I absolutely do support the motion. Um, I think it's interesting to consider though, um, you know, where it goes. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone has any suggestions, maybe this is something we can consider and, and think about um, if it does make it to the board table. But um, I think as one of the newer trustees, the, the last time I recall um, hearing anything about the police liaison officers um, was around the question of continued funding um, in early, fall 2018. Um, and I know that um, our superintendent did provide a memo um, through uh, the Education Policy and Direction Standing Committee in November 2018, I believe, regarding police liaison officers. Um, and, um, and I know that we are one of, I believe, several school districts um, in our region uh, that um, along with uh, the police um, and municipalities uh, take part in a regional safety committee, I believe it's called, on a monthly basis. And again, last time we were briefed um, that I believe that those meetings take place at Tommy Building. So um, I'm sure there's a lot going on. And I, I think that, um, you know, it's a wonderful time to embrace this discussion um, and really evaluate where we are and how we want to move forward in the future. So thank you. Uh, Tracy McNally. 
Thank you. Um, I'm not sure uh, what's uh, what's at the forefront of the equity committee's um, mind as an entity right now, but I th think what we're hearing here is that I guess all the issues are you know could be deserved to be fast tracked, but given broad, broad community experiences around um, police and society generally. I think that uh, this could be well deserving of a fast track with the equity committee to get the discussion and uh, community people pulled together uh, as fast as possible. I just hope we can fast track it because I, I do hear from community members um, some deep questioning as other people have uh, expressed here tonight. So it's gonna be a great conversation. And thank you also again um, from me to Trustee Painter for bringing this forward. Hey, any other speakers? Thank you, Trustee Whitaker and then Trustee Ryan Painter. You're muted, Anne. I want to acknowledge the comments made about the equity committee and whether or not this is the appropriate location for this discussion. Um, but so what I'm going to say is that I'm going to support the motion now written with equity, but I'm definitely going to give that a little bit of thought. Uh, thank you, Robin, for those comments. I'm going to give that a little bit of thought over the next week or so before the board meeting and, uh, and, and see if there's a better place for that. But I will support it as it's written now. Okay, Trustee Painter, Ryan Painter. Yeah, I just, I had similar uh, on the equity committee as well with uh, with Trustee Whitaker, similar thoughts to to Robin's, um, wanting to make sure that this is something that we, we do move on quickly, but not so fast that we're not bringing in as many people as possible to have the conversation and be engaged. Um, You'll note that there is a notice of motion from me, uh, which will come to September ops, specifically tasking or looking, hoping uh, to task the superintendent with uh, immediately uh, uh, looking to uh, find a process to phase out the program. So I'm not sure if uh, putting in a motion, um, uh, you know, to or amending it to report out in September ops is in is in play. I'm not going to move that because I'm not quite sure that that fits, but that may be an option that the committee wants to go in. Trustee Leonard? Uh, if this is still underway in September, uh, I believe Trustee Painter's, Ryan Painter's motion would be out of order at the time if we were still undergoing this process. So um, it might be something that we would have to delay until the process that if this goes forward that we are in is finished yeah fair okay any further discussion on the motion trustee rob painter i just wanted to offer that i would i'm certainly not married to the equity committee uh I was just trying to fit the the most well the most logical in terms of uh, area of content um, organization to the to the motion, but uh, I'm quite happy to look at a different mechanism for moving forward with the conversation. Um, I'm just thinking back to our dress code conversation, which was a pretty challenging conversation. And we did have a ad hoc committee take on that to varying degrees of success in a certain way. But it definitely was a good place to bring people together and allow sort of that free flow of conversation. Um, so, um, I mean, I was on the equity committee for quite some time as well. And I think the, the equity committee is as good as the work that's given to it. And so if there's a task, then, you know, I think, you know, any ad hoc committee is probably a good place to start that conversation. Um, so yeah, sorry to add on after you closed, but I, I wanted to add in my two cents. So I'll call the question, all those in favor? And that's unanimous. 
which is good. Okay, look at us finishing on a high note here. So then at I1, I think we're now sort of out of order around this motion, although I want to recognize Trusty Painter. Both our Trusty Painters are working to address the same uh, challenges, and, and certainly it's um, uh, clearly shared curiosities and concerns among all the, uh, the trustees. So, um, uh, Trustee Ryan Painter, are you okay with leaving that as is? And then certainly as, um, depending on what happens at the board meeting, we can revisit and of course, whatever yeah. recommendations come forward. Sorry, Chair, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm getting oh, a delay sorry. in my headset. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a, uh, we've referred a motion on an anti-racism framework and policy to October. So I think this all really fits together. Um, so if, uh, if we come to October, uh, pardon me, September ops and, and we're uh, still discussing this in some fashion, I, I have no problem with moving it uh, forward. I, I think that makes sense with the work that we're doing and it's thoughtful work and that matters. So yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite comfortable with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Any general announcements? My puppy still isn't house trained. That's all I've got. I'm getting my hair cut next week. I'm pretty stoked. <laughs> I notice Elaine and Ryan are both looking really sharp with their haircuts. Actually, there's a few folks with some good haircuts. Okay, given that, then we can adjourn at 939 if we have a motion to do so. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, look forward to the board meeting as we close out this extraordinary uh, school year. Thank you for chairing, Jordan. Oh, no problem. Sorry, you, we're, it was well a little done. bit of a bumpy start, but I feel like we finished strong. <laughs> Thank you. Good, Good night, night everyone. Good night.